much. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Hello. Great to see y'all. Great to see you again. <laughs> Great to see you, too. It's been a, it's been a long while. Yeah. Nah, she's grown up a little bit. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yes, yes. It really is great to be with you all. I'm Michael Creed. Um, I am a pastor at Mustard Seed Christian Church, the church that uh, you all have prayed for. So really thank you for your prayer. Kind of see you as our big brother church because when we first got to Hiroshima, we did not really know any churches or have any friends or anything like that. You all were very welcoming to us. Really, really deeply thankful. And so I want to send and just give you right now our sincere gratitude. We really do feel thankful for you all. And yeah, not just speaking for me, but also for my wife, Yumi, uh, who's still downtown right now, probably doing a, a beginner's Bible study with some friends, and also my son, but also the whole church. And so we just want to say we love you all. Uh, we thank God for you, and really thankful to get to worship Jesus with you all forever and ever. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Well, Obviously, to say it's something that's pretty obvious, that God loves this church. God loves uh, all the local churches. God loves Mustard Seed Christian Church, uh, Mitaki Green Chapel. Uh, and then also, it's pretty obvious that neither of these churches, or uh, the churches in Hiroshima right now, we are not what we would call the early church, right? When we think about the Bible, uh, we think about Acts chapter 2, we think about this book that we're going to be reading from today. But it's really encouraging that we stand in this really long line of spiritual ancestors and Christians who have come before us. And we can read about the first ones in the book of Acts. And so this is also in your bulletin, if that's what we call it here. That's what we call it there. Uh, it's our bulletin right here, right here in the middle. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. Allow me to read this aloud and want you to follow along with me. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers, and then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Amen. At Mustard Seed Christian Church right now, we're going through the story of the Bible. Some of the, the main points of the scripture, that's what we're trying to point out. And so Peter might feel the way we kind of feel as we're trying to we're open up the Bible and go through some of the main points of Scripture. We're trying to teach people, uh, especially people who are new to their faith and especially people who've never heard the gospel before. We want to be a kind of church that welcomes all kinds of people. And so we're trying to go through some of these main points of the, the story of the Bible. We always say, hey, this is, when we say the word story, we're not talking about mythology here. No, we really do believe this is actually true. And so what we read in the book of Acts, we believe this actually historically happened, right? And I wonder if Peter, we don't know this from sure from the Bible, Peter and Stephen and some of these guys in Acts, when they're given these sermons, right, 
they are often trying to, to hit the main points of the story of the Bible up until that point, and then call people to repentance. And it's, it's, it's a gigantic story, right? It's, it's a big, beautiful story. So it pains you when you can't go through every single word. And so I wonder if they felt that way too. But Peter here, he is given this awesome sermon up through about verse 36. Uh, and he even says, you crucified Jesus, right? It's pretty heavy. This Jesus whom you crucified, in verse 36, pretty offensive, right? But if you look at verse 37, these friends, these people, they have a really miraculous kind of amazing reaction to that sermon. So in verse 37, if you look at it, they ask Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Right? Brothers, what shall we do? And if we put that in more modern language, we might rephrase it, you know, modern English, we might say, okay, pastor, what's the application of this sermon? <laughs> right? What's, what's the application? What, do you, what are we supposed to do with that? Right? It's really important to, to notice that the early church was born and it grew as the hearers applied a sermon. So Peter just gave this excellent sermon, and their reaction is, how should we apply this beautiful gospel truth, right? It's good to let that sink in for a second. This morning we asked our congregation too, but when, this is a question you can just answer in your own heart, right? When is the last time you heard a sermon and then you immediately sought to apply it? You heard it, you thought, okay, I've got to, I gotta, I gotta do something with this, right? Do you open the word of God? Do you enjoy it? Do you seek to apply it to your life? Is the word of God changing you? Do you want it to change you? How has faith in God changed your life? Right? We should be ready, even if your answer is, absolutely, it's changed my life, 100%, for sure. We should be ready to share that with others, right? Well, these Jews, they, they heard Peter's sermon, and they wanted to know what they ought to do. So they heard that they have sinned. They heard that Jesus suffered and died. They knew they were responsible for the death of the Messiah, right? They didn't kick back against verse 36 when he said, you crucified Jesus. They actually said, yes, what, what should we do, right? They heard that God raised Jesus from the dead. They heard about the resurrection. And so, brothers, what shall we do? How can we apply this message? How do we apply this truth? How do we apply this gospel? We believe it. What, what do we ought to do? What, what should we do? And look back down at verse 38. And so, repent, right? Repent. So anyone who has repented of sin is a Christian, right? Every Christian should be baptized. Baptism doesn't save us. Jesus saves us when we place our faith in him and when we love him. Baptism, biblically, in Acts and other parts of the Bible, the example we have is you're saved, you believe in Jesus, you confess Him, He's your Lord, He's your Savior, you love Him. And then, pretty soon after that, you get baptized. So that's what happened that day. If you look at verse 39, we're just going verse by verse. If you look back down at verse 39, you see that phrase right there, all who are afar off. So the promise is for you uh, Jewish people who are hearing this right now, but also it's for everyone who is far off. What does that mean? Well, if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17, you'll see that same phrase come up. It's talking about Jesus, and I'll just read it for you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17. And it says, And he, talking about Jesus, 
He came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Now, we live in the city of peace, right? The city of Hewa, right? The city we love so much. Jesus came to this earth and he preached peace, yes, to the Jewish people. He was Jewish. But he also preached peace to those like us, to my, the best of my understanding in the room, who are not Jewish. He came and he preached peace and he taught his disciples, go and preach peace to everyone. Our spiritual ancestors did a good job. We're here. We believe in Jesus, right? Look at verse 40 with me again in verse 41. I want you to notice that Peter and the apostles, they continue giving instructions and application, right? I want you to notice also how, how little time passes between the repentance and the faith and the confession. Uh, all those happen really close together. Uh, you repent of your sin, and the other side of that coin is you believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin, right? As Peter said. You confess it. You say it out loud. I believe in Jesus. I love him. I want him. I need him to forgive my sin. And then there's the baptism, right? So there's hardly any time at all between those two events. To the best of our knowledge, what it's saying right here, a really simple reading of the Bible says it was the same day, right? So they repented, they believed in Jesus, and then they were baptized. And so that same day, 3,000 people were saved and baptized. It's just awesome. And they heard a sermon about the story of the Bible. And then they immediately made sermon application, right? So they heard the word. Then they also, they wanted to do the word. So it's not just, just a seminar. It's not just a classroom. It's not like that. It's you hear it, and then you want to do something with it, right? James chapter 1, verse 22, it says it really simply. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So let's do that. Let's be doers of the word, not just hearers. We're going to keep going. Verse 42. If you look here, I love this so much. It's so simple, so straightforward. It's just a list of ways that the first churches applied their faith in Jesus to their lives. Right? So they, it says in my version, in, in the ESV, that they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So you can count... Four main things that they were devoting themselves to. They were devoted to it. It's pretty, pretty strong language. So we take a step back. We just read that. We just heard that, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So we need to ask ourselves, right, what did the apostles teach, right? And they taught, taught many things, right? There's a lot of ways you can answer that. They wrote... Gospels for us, all those things. But if you had to sum it up in one word, just one word or one little phrase, you could say the gospel. They taught us the gospel. They taught us about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. They taught us that we're going to live forever, that God through Jesus gives us eternal life. We get to live forever when we believe in Jesus, and we get to worship Him forever. This Holy Spirit is going to completely change our hearts and our minds and the way we think about the world. We're going to go from hatred of God and being dead in our sin to being alive to God and finally being reconciled to Him. No longer do you have to worry about if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. A lot of religions in the world think that way. A lot of people in the world think this way, but they're saying, no, 
The gospel is, you, though you're evil and though you sinned against God, and though you don't deserve to be forgiven, and though you don't deserve to be loved, and though you didn't know God, and though you were dead in your sin, and though you had no hope in this world at all, Jesus came for you. He loves you way more than you can possibly imagine. To the point of taking nails in his wrist, going up on a cross, dying on a Roman crucifix right there, suffered, crown of thorns, he died, he was buried. Three days later though, God raised him back to life and that verified, confirmed every word that Jesus ever spoke. He really is the Son of God. He really will come back. Right now, we have to repent, believe, follow Him. And we get this joy. And that falls on your hearts if we believe in Jesus. And that sounds like awesome news. We are not offended at Jesus anymore. Now we love Him. Now we want to be with Him. So when we say we get to be with Jesus forever, along with all the other churches that you're consistently praying for and all the other Christians in this world, we get to be with Jesus. We get to worship Him. We're not going to need the sun anymore because God is going to be Himself our light. We're not going to need any more anything else. We're going to have Him. It's going to be awesome. And there's nothing in this whole world that's ever going to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It's good news. That's a small, 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 small snippet of how beautiful and gigantic and everlasting God's good news is. We really are going to get to be with Him, and it really will be truly wonderful. With no more sin, no more suffering, no more cancer, no more separation from your family, the family of God's going to be together. And we're going to praise Him. It's going to be awesome. So that's what they taught, right? That's what the apostles teach. Like you, these people believed in it. They believed this gospel. And so they devoted themselves to that gospel. They devoted themselves. So it's, that's not a casual word, right? They were devoted to it. There's a lot of people who devote their lives to other things, right? Some of them are sinful. Some of them aren't. Some of them are like the Hiroshima carp, which we all like. That's okay. But we ought to devote ourselves not to anything less than the gospel, what this Bible teaches us, right? And so looking back at verse 42, there's so much more we can say about the gospel and how beautiful it is. But back in verse 42, they devoted themselves to learning what the apostles taught. And so... In other words, those are the words that we have recorded in the Bible. So we don't get to, to hang out with Peter in person, incarnationally. He's not physically here with us right now. But we do have what he believed written in the Bible for us. That's God's word to all of humanity. And so us too, here in 2024, here in this room, we ought to devote ourselves to God's Word and to the Bible. Number two, the early church devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. But what does that mean? It has a lot of meaning and a ton of application, but it means at least that they gathered together often. They gathered together regularly, right? That they loved one another. You can definitely see love for one another in this church. I want to commend that. Continue loving each other. It's really beautiful. I want to commend that and just say, like Paul told the Thessalonians, hey, no one has any need to write to you about brotherly love. You're already doing that, right? But I want to encourage you to continue doing that more and more and more. Fellowship involves loving each other. And sharing your resources. So just share, right? Everything comes from God. We don't have to feel awkward about offering or anything like that. Everything we have, everything, all of it, doesn't belong to us. We're stewards of it. God gave it to us to use for His sake, right? The early church understood that and shared everything together. Number three, 
in verse 42, verse 42, we see that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And we believe that breaking of bread, this phrase, it means, yes, we observe communion, and I believe we're going to do that today. But it also just means just plain old eating together, right? You eat with the people you love, that you spend a lot of time with, and so they were devoted to eating with each other. That's pretty significant. We're going to apply this word today. We're going to enjoy communion. I'm excited for that. And number four, they devoted themselves to prayer. Number four, they devoted themselves to prayer. So you'll notice that each of these four things are present in uh, healthy church gatherings, right? You go to a healthy church, you'll hear prayer, you'll hear God's word being taught, uh, you'll hopefully see people trying to apply that word. And hopefully these are also present throughout the week, not just Sundays, right? But they ought to be continually present. So church staff members, when they, they get together for a logistics meeting, there should be prayer happening in that meeting, right? When you get together for a Bible study, it should, it should, it should include prayer, right? You get together with other Christians, we ought to be praying together. Uh, the missionaries in Hiroshima, including uh, Pastor Chris, the pastors gathering together fairly regularly to pray for one another and to pray for the city, to pray for the congregations that are represented, it's really beautiful and it ought to keep happening. Right? Now, in Acts, what we have is this really beautiful book that's descriptive, it's describing what happened in the early church, right? So we have a descriptive passage here, but anyone who reads the Bible it doesn't have to read it too hard or to get a college degree in it or anything to see that, no, this is not just for the early church. This is also for every church that exists in 2024. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing. Um, that can't mean pray without pausing, because you also have to sleep sometimes. But we ought to also pray so often that it feels like when you're praying, that you just want to keep praying, and that other things coming in, like, oh, I want to spend this day praying, but I also realize that I also have to go to work, right? So the other things are the hindrance to prayer, uh, are, are the, the break between prayer. You can view prayer that way, to pray continually. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, this might be read again today, just tells us to do communion regularly. Keep on observing, taking the bread and taking the cup. Keep on observing communion until Jesus comes back. Keep proclaiming the death of Jesus that way. Hebrews 10 verse 25 tells us, do not neglect to meet together. And so, according to our passage today, in other words, devote yourself to the fellowship, right? And then Matthew 4.4 4 is the verse I read when I was saved, uh, when I didn't know Jesus. I read this verse, completely changed my entire whole universe, right? But Matthew 4.4 4, tells us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I really love that verse. So Jesus himself is teaching us, love God's word. Love it. Memorize it. Take it in. Receive it. Use it to fight against Satan and the enemy. Use it. Treasure it. Talk about it. Listen to it. Do what it says. We ought to be applying God's word. Every church needs to be a praying church. Every church needs to be a fellowshipping church. Uh, every church should observe communion with reverence regularly. And every church should teach and believe the word of God.
We'll keep going. We've got a few more verses. Verses 43 to 46. Here you see this beautiful depiction of love for one another. Um, and unfortunately, some people have kind of taken this, this little passage and have twisted it a little bit in a way that it's not meant to be used. It's not about communism. <laughs> it's not about socio socioeconomic system. Uh, it's, it's really clear here that there's no government intervention or anything like that. There's no law that says this has to happen in this way. What you see is completely organic and natural when people love each other, when they hear how much Jesus loves us. They love each other. There's no cult-like activity going on right here. There's no... Uh, spiritual leader saying this is what it's got to look like. Nothing like that. It's so pure. It's so beautiful. Genuinely, people considering each other brothers and sisters, loving one another. And you see verse 47, and we'll end right here. Yeah, what does it say? It says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. We really want to see this. We really want to see God save more people in the world, right? Uh, every Christian wants that. We really want to see that in Japan, in Hiroshima, here in Mitaki, everywhere. We really want more people to hear the gospel to hear a sermon like Peter preached. We want people to know God's word. And we don't want that so that we could brag about the number of people coming to a church or anything like that. That's not what we want. What we want is our neighbors, your neighbors, our senpai, our bosses, our kohai, everyone, right? Your family members that don't know Jesus yet, your relatives, everyone, want everyone to know and taste how good God is. We really want that. And so, if you can imagine that happening more and more and more all around the world, all around Hiroshima, that would mean, Lord willing, all of these seats taken, and we got to bring in some more chairs in the back, right? Because we want everyone to have a chance to hear the gospel everyone to know it, everyone to believe it. We want this prayer to be answered, that there will be an awakening in Japan, awakening all over the world as we wait for Jesus. We want that for every church that preaches the gospel. And I want that for you and your friends and your family and everyone else that you've been praying for. We add our prayer to let them come, let them hear this gospel, let them believe it, let them know, and let them not only be here, that's not the end goal. The end goal is they believe in Jesus and they have a seat at the table in the kingdom of God. And that they could be worshiping Jesus, the lamb that was slain with us forever and ever, including these 3,000 people in Acts chapter 2. I want you to know that God works through us Right? This is not a long list of things that you have to do, and God is not like a boss who drops a bunch of work on you, then walks away and says, good luck, figure it out, or you're going to get fired. That's not our God. That's not how he does it. Jesus already promised he's going to be with us. The Holy Spirit's inside of you right now. God the Father is actively sending you every single thing that you need to do his will. And so this is not burdensome, right? This is not a burdensome thing to do. This is a joy to do. So I want to end by just giving you a few simple ways to apply God's Word. It's a sermon about sermon application, so we've got to give some, some, some potential application points. So Number one is make a prayer list. If you don't have one already, I just want to highly, highly, highly recommend keeping a list of things to pray for. That can be with a prayer app, it could be with a notebook, scratch paper, or if you have one, uh, keep it updated. <laughs> There's some things that need to be updated. Uh, sister said earlier that it's a joy to, to tick them off the list, right? God answered this prayer, right? 
uh, and, and thank him for it. Number two is, I believe this church is so good at this. Um, I love this culture here. But number two is to devote yourself to prayer by initiating praying with someone else, right? Just initiate and ask how you can pray for them or share your own prayer request, even if you're not asked first, right? You can, you can be the initiator. You can say, hey, I would love for you to pray for me in this way. How might I pray for you? Let's pray right now. And it doesn't have to be on Sunday. It could be any time. Number three, you could devote yourself to the apostles' teaching by listening to more than one sermon per week, right? And so I know you're getting great sermons here, but there are also other preachers in the world, as you know. And so we can take in more than one sermon per week. Really easy to listen to. It's on YouTube, all those things. I'm sure uh, Pastor Chris and others here would, would be willing to, to happily share other preachers that teach the Word of God. Number four, I just want to encourage you to devote yourself to the fellowship by keep doing what you're doing. You're coming to a local church gathering every single Sunday. Keep prioritizing that. Don't allow the enemy to let you think or lie to you and say that it's not that important. You can just kind of do it by yourself. Nope, it's not true. That's a lie. We need each other. So I want to encourage you to, to keep doing what you're doing. Keep coming every single Sunday uh, that you can make it. Number five is memorize God's Word. To memorize God's Word. That's a way we can devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. You can challenge yourself. Make it challenging, right? And enjoy the challenge. Maybe you could say, I want to memorize these ten verses. Maybe it's a passage that really spoke to your heart. I just want to memorize it word for word for word till it's in my heart so that when I go to sleep at night, I don't have to work hard to remember it. It's just there, right there in the middle of my heart. If that sounds like a lot, don't, don't worry. You could do one verse first, two verses, three verses. Or if that sounds like too little, you say, I want to do a whole chapter. Do it. And then share uh, that, that passage with other people. Right? Um, we really need to live on God's word. It's not, it's not an option. So let's take it in, memorize it. Number six, this leads into what we're about to do, but devote yourself to the breaking of bread with communion. We're going to do that uh, very soon. Those are just a few, but the Holy Spirit might give you way more and very different applications, very specific to you and your life and your heart. So listen to the Holy Spirit. Whatever he's speaking to you right now, uh, receive it, write it down so you don't forget, like I'm prone to forget it. And it could be something completely different than what I just said, and that's okay. I want to remind you that the Holy Spirit's with you. I want to encourage you to keep walking in step with the Holy Spirit. I want to Say something that's very obvious, but uh, I hope this is very obvious to us, but we won't ever regret doing God's Word. We won't ever regret it. We won't. We must devote ourselves to applying the Bible's teaching. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, I love very dearly the brothers and sisters here at this local church at Mitaki. Glad that when I think about Mitaki, it's the first thing I think of on this congregation. Father, we confess that we need your help to devote ourselves to your teaching. We need your help to, to do your will. We need you. We need your help to maintain fellowship, and we need, to, uh, we need your help uh, to, to do what you call us to do. And we're very confident, Father, as you are very kind, gentle, gracious, empowering, loving, wonderful, perfect Father. 
that you will help us as your children to do uh, your word, not just hear it. It's very easy to hear it and forget it. Help us not to be hearers only, but help us to be doers. We love you so much. and We want nothing more than to obey you, to do the things that please you. You will work in us to do what pleases you. So please help my brothers and sisters and help me, help us, help all of us uh, to do your will, to devote ourselves, to devote ourselves to prayer and your teaching and fellowship and to the breaking of bread. We pray this with great joy in the name of Jesus. Amen.